looking at, there are great benefits to having the fear of the Lord. Amen? Okay? So the first thing is there are great benefits to, ha to having the fear of the Lord. The first thing is Jesus' delight is in the fear of the Lord. And see, we, it depends on what group, camp, however you like to place it, uh, that you're f familiar with, a part of, or you listen to in the body of Christ, you know, you have this mindset, well, you don't want people to fear God. No, you don't want people to fear God. But Jesus is delighted in the fear of the Lord. Let's go to Isaiah 11 and 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Verse 3, his delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity, equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Okay, now, so we're looking at, so if Jesus, if God delights in what? The fear of the Lord, we need to delight in it. Second thing, Jesus taught his disciples to fear God. Let's go to Luke 12. So we from the pulpit, those that are called to be, whether whatever fivefold ministry gift, you could be in more than one office, whether apostle, prophet, or prophetess, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, regardless, needs to be preached from the pulpit, the fear of God. If that's what Jesus taught his disciples, that's what we're supposed to talk, teach the people that come, to, that come as we minister. Let's go to Luke 12 and 4. Because some people say, well, Jesus didn't tell them the, the fear of God. Yeah, he did. Luke 12 and 4, and here it says, And I say to you, my friends, this is in the red, this is Jesus speaking, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed. And some people say, well, you know, this is the devil. They're, not they're talking about the devil because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. They're not talking about God. No, they're talking about God. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Nobody goes to hell without God's permission, and nobody goes to heaven without God's permission. Let's look at the C. People willfully sin. I mean, sinning on purpose. It's not just that they're bound and they don't know how to get free, but I mean they are on purpose willfully sinning because they have no fear of God. That's it. That is the root of it. No fear of God. So people what? Willfully sin, or in other words, sin on purpose. And I'm differentiating between people that are bound and, you know, they just cry, God, why, do, why am I like this or whatever, uh, you know, whatever. These people I'm not talking about. I'm talking about the people who sin willfully and have no remorse because they're not in bondage to sin uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not that this is taking control of them and they can't help it. I'm talking about the people who willfully sin on purpose, do not try to get help, probably know how to get help, probably know how to stop, but on purpose, they are willfully sinning. Why? They have no fear of God. Let's go on. Let's go to... Um, let's go to... Well, see, we just started reading that people willfully sin, that's where I left off, dishonoring God. Uh, they dishonor his service. They dishonor his house when they have no fear of God. Let's go to Malachi 1 and 6. Last book of the Old Testament, Malachi 1 and 6. Malachi 1 and 6. Let me get there. And here it simply says, it says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, he didn't say a father, he said what? The father. And if I am a master, where is my reverence? 
So when we talk about the fear of God, what we're literally talking about what is a reverence for God. Where is my reverence? Where is my fear? Because that's what we're talking about. And see, when, when people have a, a wrong fear of God, they're afraid to go to him. But when you have a reverence from God, you honor him, you respect him, you understand that he's there for your good, but you understand we are not to handle him lightly. We do not, uh, you know, so, so we give him the full honor, the full reverence, the full fear that he deserves. And so, of course, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we're born again, he now is Abba, which is what? Father or Daddy God to us, but we're not to take him lightly. We're to have a fear and a reverence of him because of who he is. And there are many aspects of God. The Bible lets us know in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, around 29, 30, somewhere around there. And it talks about, uh, for we have in this unshakable kingdom, or this kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace that we may serve God acceptably. What is grace given for? To serve God. How do we know that? We go to Ephesians, the second chapter, when it says we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not of any works. None of us can boast in that because it wasn't us it was by grace through faith in lord jesus christ that we're saved so it wasn't our works works mean absolutely nothing bc before christ comes into your life after christ comes into your life if you continue to read that portion of scripture in um ephesians the second chapter i think when you get around the verse 10 it talks about for we are his workmanship god's workmanship created in christ jesus for the good works he has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So every believer, that same grace that was there for you to receive, be saved by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ is there for you to do those good works that he has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. And then, as I said, you go over to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, I believe around 29, 30, somewhere around there, and it talks about let us have grace that we may serve God acceptably. And then we looked at another aspect of God, for our God is a consuming fire. He's love, but he's a consuming fire too, okay? And we don't take him lightly. We don't handle him lightly. We don't, um, uh, we're not inappropriate in our relationship to God. Yes, he's still daddy, but he's creator of heaven and earth. So the fear that we're talking about is basically, uh, the Bible's alluding to is what they have uh, written here in the New King James, which is reverence, and I believe the Old King James calls it fear, okay? And it says, says the Lord of hosts, it, to you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? by saying that the table of the Lord is contemptible, okay? And then he says, eight, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not? Times we just look at us, okay? Instead of looking globally. Glo globally, there are great awakenings, there are revivals, there are things that are going on globally. But we know a couple of things about things that are called to go on with us and with our city and with our state. Okay, now, start with us personally, okay? So we've had prophets, we've had people to come to our ministry uh, over the years, the last, within the last seven, eight years, who come to our ministry, and one of the things was uh, the whole city was going to be drawn here because of the light. And then a totally different one uh, talks about, you know, the whole city being drawn here. Then uh, we have the uh, one that God sent the end of December, okay? Another prophet. Now, this is it. You all look at what title they call themselves. Apostle, bishop, missionary, pastor. I look at the gift in which they speak from, okay? And so, and then uh, before him, so with the men's conference, and then uh, he spoke on our weekend services. That was a prophet as well. And on the 8 o'clock service, he just mentioned about how something big was about to happen. It was going to happen suddenly. Next weekend, another guy 
a prophet, go by a different title. He came to see uh, Sister Teresa Thiango, who was here from Africa, take her out to lunch. Uh, so he drove out of town to be here. And what happened that night, he had like a four hour vision dream about transformation and what God was gonna do in God's visitation of this house. And, what, and he said it was at what? The doorstep, okay? So some things we know personally God is gonna do here. And it would behoove all of us to have a fear of the Lord because this is what happened when you don't as we read further. And for various other reasons. The second thing is, so that's 100% that's, that's personal, our church. And then you have to look at our city, okay? Uh, Maria Woodard Etter, back at the World's Fair, 1901, 1902, whenever we had it here, prophesied about a great move of God that would be in here, and I believe it was the city of St. Louis. And then uh, Kenneth E. Hagan, uh, he was at a church in Chesterfield, but he prophesied how St. Louis would be the gateway to revival, okay? So we have been praying probably uh, three plus years on our Wednesday 12 noon prayer, and then some others, other 12 noons prayer, but that's basically when it's done. The Wednesday 12 noon prayer, praying in agreement for the revival that God has called for the city of St. Louis, okay? Then we know, you know, revival breaking out different places, but we know what, what's coming here is a visitation, okay? Now, then you, and then too, which would be a part of a great awakening. And then you have the prophecy that resurfaced that was given in 2008 or before by Bob Jones, another prophet. See, many prophets don't use their titles, okay? They use other titles that are more acceptable. Doctor, you know, Dr. Dufresne, Eagle Eye Prophet. He didn't go by Prophet Ed Dufresne, he went by what? Doctor. And so, but I'm just identifying them as prophets and what they're flowing through, okay? And so what happens is, um, so Bob Jones, okay? Prophet. And what happened, Seer. And so it was 2008 or before that he, God t showed him and told him that uh, when the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, that's when the uh, revival is about to begin. You see what I'm saying? So for us, you know, as a church, we already know God's visitation is at the doorstep. For us as a city, we know some things. And then for us as a nation, we know some things. Okay? Now, and so there are some things that God is about to do. And like I said, I don't want to be limited because globally there are some massive outbreaks of uh, spiritual awakening and revivals. Okay, now, so this is, you know, the early church, there was a great spiritual awakening. There was a great power, great persecution. This is the time setting that they were in. And so then it goes on. Verse three, well, I'm sort of one. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the land for yourself? No fear of God. When you have no fear of God, you don't honor his servants who are representing him in God's bidding because you have what? No fear of God. You are lying to them and not understanding you're lying to God. And so, of course, we know here it was pride, wanting to look good in front of other people. We understand it's probably a little covetousness, lust, a whole bunch of stuff going on. But what's the root of it? No fear of God. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Verse 5, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. What did Jesus say in Luke? Fear him that can kill you, and after that can put you into hell.
So great fear came upon all who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what happened. And Peter answered her, Pe uh, Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Now understand this. When you go to Ephesians in the fifth chapter, they're talking about wives submit to your own husbands, okay? That means the Bible never contradicts itself, so you submit to your own husband in everything but sin. I don't care if he is your husband. If he tell you to lie, you don't lie. Why is that? He may be your husband the short period of time you're on planet Earth, but if you're a believer, you belong to God for eternity. That's a higher relationship. And lying is a characteristic of the devil. He's a liar, and he's the father of lies. And then we also look in the book of Revelation, uh, one of the places it talks about, and it gives this, this list of those that will go into the lake of fire, it starts off with the fearful or the cowardly depends on what translation new king james cowardly probably old king james probably fearful and i don't know about other translations but the first listing is to be what cowardly or fearful why do sometimes people do what they know they should not do cowardly and fearful of man and see what happens is we got our fear in the wrong place we're supposed to fear god instead of people <laughs> cowardly or fearful whichever one the phrase you want to use for the first one. The second was what? Unbelieving. Now, we, we can believe everything but what God said if it's something supernatural. And we have to check that. We have to watch that. Because what does the Bible talks about? Those who have a form of godliness. Well, you know, I'm going to live sweet. I want to live holy. I want to blah, 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 blah. You're not holy if you don't believe God because you call him a liar. And what happens is it talks about um, those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. God is a God of power. Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she says, yes, for so much. So what was going on here? Let's say he sold the land for, I used to say 200,000. Let me bring it down. Let's say he sold the land for 50,000, okay? Let's say he sold the, the property or whatever for 50,000. And so they decide they want to keep 25,000. So what they do, we sold this land for 75,000. I mean, I'm sorry, it's 50, so let's go down. Okay, 30, okay? Let's say they want to keep 20. I, we sold this, they actually sold the land for 50,000. And so what happens, they sell the land for 50,000, and then they tell them, okay, we sold this land for 30,000, and here's the money. Peter said, hey, nobody told you you had to sell it in the first place. A lot of people during that time, they were selling their properties to, to help the brethren who have lost everything out of persecution once they came to faith and started following the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now, and so what happened, so others were doing that, but they were never commanded they had to sell their land. And so he wanted to make sure he looked like he was self-sacrificing and he was serving the Lord like everybody else. So he sold a piece of land, sold it for 50000 lied and said he sold it for 30000 And so Peter said, why are you lying to the Holy Ghost? You didn't have to sell it. And when you did sell it, you could have gave as much as you wanted to. But to lie to the Holy Ghost, mm -mm, he dropped dead. Then his wife comes in. They say, hey, did, he, did you all sell this piece of property for so much? You sell it for 30000 She said, yes, we did. Let's see what happened to her. Verse 9, and Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Why? Because you don't, what's the word? You don't fear him. That's why you'll test him. To test the spirit of the Lord. Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she did what? She fell dead. What did Jesus teach his disciples? Don't fear people that can, somebody, don't fear someone that can kill you, but then after they kill you, they can't do anything else. You fear him that can kill you and put you in hell if he wants to. That's who you fear. And that's God. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out and buried her by her husband. Verse 11, key. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. We don't just see it in verse 11 when, after the wife, because that was, now it was the husband and then it was the wife, but we see it in verse 5 after the husband. And Ananias, hearing these things, fell down and breathed his left, last, 
his last verse, and then so great fear came upon all who heard these things. Okay? When Ananias died, great fear came. When Ananias and uh, his wife died, it says, what, 11? So great fear came upon the church and, all, and upon all who heard these things. Jesus already gave him a heads up. He told his disciples, don't fear him that can kill you, and after he kill you, he can't do anything else. You fear him who, that can kill you, and after he kills you, he can put you in hell if he wants to. That's who you fear. You fear God. Let's go to Gospel of John, chapter 2 and 13. Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 13. Two and 13. And here we stay, 2 and 13. Now, the Passover of the Jews, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Now, historically, what they say at the Passover, there were probably anywhere from 300,000 people to 400,000 people who had came from everywhere to celebrate the Passover here. And it says... Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple. Now we have to differentiate between the temple and synagogues. Synagogues were what we might call similar to like maybe small local churches, okay, where people would meet and gather, they were close, okay? Uh, but they were for the Jews, so you know, Jewish synagogues, okay? Now, but the temple was humongous, humongous. And people were coming from all over to worship God because it was the Passover, okay? Or to keep the Passover. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured, and poured out the changers' money and overt overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Okay? So in their case, what were they doing? They were just profiting out of, off of these hundreds of thousands of people that were coming from all over to offer sacrifices. And so, you know, yeah, they did probably need to make, change their currency often. Uh, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't drag uh, certain animals that they might want to sacrifice, drag them from, you know, miles and miles away, and they'd be in good condition to offer. You know, so there was a purpose in it, but they had turned this whole celebration of the Passover. Okay, but anyway, so Black Friday, I apologize what I meant, Black Friday. It was, it was created by merchants so that they would end the fiscal year in the black instead of the red. And so they get you into the red, spending all this money you don't need to spend, so you're in the red at the end of the fiscal year, but they're in the black. But what you have to understand, the merchants just looked at this as a good time to profit, and that's what it turned into. And it, 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 the spiritual aspect of it was removed, and it was just a time to profit and do business because you got all of these hundreds of thousands of people gathered. Okay, now, so then his disciples remembered what that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. And see, what happens is we don't have a fear of God when it's prayer time and we're talking to people. I mean, I've ministered on this probably the last three or four years, more than once or twice. You know, when you're in prayer, somebody come up to you to talk, you say, oh, I'm talking to somebody, I'm talking to God right now. If you're talking to God right now, how is any other person worth being interrupted, interrupting you? And then, too, that's a teaching moment. I'm talking to God right now. I'll talk to you after prayer. Okay? And so what happens is, that's what? That's a lack of fear of God expressed in dishonoring his house. We're in service, and you floating around starting conversations with people. Hey, how you doing? Up here at work going forward. Worship going forward. Praise team up here. Uh, maybe me or somebody speaking or whatever, and you, you, you reach, hey, how you doing? Dishonoring God's house. Because you have no fear of God. I mean, the, I mean, it's a plethora of things. 
But when there's no fear of God, there are certain traits people will willfully sin on purpose. And I'm, I always like to differentiate between the people that are struggling. We're not talking about people struggling with sin. I'm talking about people who on purpose willfully sin. What's the purpose? What's the, what, what's, what's the reason? No fear of God. People who dishonor God's servants. What, what's the issue? No fear of God. People that dishonor God's house. What's the issue? No fear of God. And what happens when God's visitation comes? You need to make sure you're right. You need to make sure you're right. In that you honor God's house. You're not sinning willfully. And you're not uh, dishonoring his servants. Okay? Now, I always like to clarify. You can drop dead any second. So you, you, regardless of what happened, what don't happen. This is how we all need to live our lives. Not just because the reality is we can die any second. That's the reality. The second reason is there should be a really strong desire in our heart to please God because we love him. As well as a fear of God. Let's go to D. There are some great benefits, a multitude of great benefits to having the fear of the Lord. One, you are blessed. Let's go to Psalms 128 and 1. Psalms 128 and 1. Psalms 128 and 1. And here it simply says, 128 and 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and walks in his ways. So if we have a fear of the Lord, we're walking in his ways, because the fear of the Lord will definitely help us to walk in his, promote us walking in his ways. But we are what? We're blessed. What else? God himself, almighty creator of heaven and earth. God is so massive and awesome. Of course, we know he's omnipresent, but the Bible says what? The earth is his footstool. He just rests his foot. He's that massive. Okay? Let's go there. Let's go to Psalms 147 and 11. 147 and 11, and it says, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. You want God to take pleasure in you? Fear him. Don't believe that, that false doctrine. You don't want anybody to fear God. Don't fear God. You don't want anybody. That's a lie. Give me scriptures for that one. God takes pleasure in those who fear him. Let's look at number three. I mean, it's like a, a plethora of things. You can find them everywhere. Let's go to three. Let's go to Proverbs 1 and 7. Proverbs 1 and 7. Proverbs 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Let's look at another one. It is the beginning of wisdom. Let's go to Proverbs 9 and 10. Proverbs 9 and 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Let's go to number five. The fear of the Lord brings strong confidence into your life. If God is for me, who can I fear? If God is for me, who can be against me? Let's go to Proverbs 14 and 26. Proverbs 14 and 26. The fear of, in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. Let's look at another one. Six, it causes us to do what? Depart from evil. Proverbs 16 and 6. It says, in mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And we know Jesus did that on the cross of Calvary, shedding his blood for our atonement before that they used lambs. But he is what? The lamb who was slain before the foundation of the earth, according to the book of Revelation. Okay? But by the fear of the Lord, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Anybody willfully sinning, why? They don't have a fear of the Lord. Let's look at another one. Seven, it leads to life 
and protection from evil. Proverbs 19 and 23. 19 and 23. And here it states, it says, the fear of the Lord leads to life. And he who has it will abide in satisfaction. And he will not be visited with evil. Eight. There are great benefits to having the fear of the Lord. You are placed in God's book of remembrance. Amen. Let's go to Malachi 3 and 16. And I share the testimony about years ago, years and years ago, after a 12 o'clock prayer meeting. Usually I got appointments in the administration office right after prayer meeting, but back then I guess I didn't have as many or whatever. But after a 12 o'clock prayer, myself and about two or three other people, we just ended up just staying and talking. And what we were doing, we were talking about how good God was. And we were just talking, our hearts were full. And then I left, because I always go out through the basement, the garage and out. But what happened, then I left, as I went there, then the Holy Spirit was like, book of remembrance. And you know, I do my one year Bible reading, way before one year Bible reading, I used to read the Bible all the time and stuff like that, and I still do. Uh, uh, let me say this, there are times in my life, like when I first got saved, I had the grace to read the Bible eight to 10 hours a day. I'm not there, so I don't read the Bible as much as I used to, shame on me, okay? But anyway, but there was that grace to do it then. But anyway, but what happens is, I, so I had seen the scripture, but I never really, you know how you see stuff, but never really look at it? And it says, let's look at it now. Let's go to, uh, 3 and 16, until he spoke it, then I looked it up. 3 and 16. And here it states, it says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. They weren't gossiping, backbiting, slandering others. But those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him, for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. So you're placed in God's book of remembrance. That's a great benefit of, of having a fear of the Lord. You receive God's mercy. Let's go to Luke 1 and 50. Luke 1 and 50. And here it simply says, Luke 1 and 50, and his mercy is on those who what? Fear him from generation to generation. Final scripture, we get to go to our favorite book, Revelation. You will be rewarded by God when he judges you. Why? You got to fear the Lord. Let's say that you have everything quite right, not every I was dotted, not every T was crossed, but you feared God, he's going to reward you. Let's go to Revelations 11 and 18. Revelations 11 and 18. Eleven and eighteen, and here it simply says: It says, "The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should will be shall be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great." and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And so we have what? Great benefit when we fear the Lord. Let's stand to our feet for a moment, please. Let's stand to our feet for a moment. Let's just lift our hands up before the Lord and repeat after me. Say, God, in the name of Jesus, your word says that if I cover my sins, I won't prosper. But if I confess it and forsake it, I will have mercy. Your word says, if I say I have no sin, I'm deceived and the truth is not in me. But if I will confess my sins unto you, 
you are faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. God, I just worship you. I honor you. I praise you. I love you. I adore you. And I repent for all the times that I have dishonored you, that I have sinned willfully, that I have dishonored your servants, that I have dishonored your house, that I have done things that are not pleasing in your sight, that I have sinned, sins of omission, things written in the Holy Scriptures, that as a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that I was supposed to do, or things that the Holy Spirit Yes, and I forsake these sins. Every sin of commission, everything that's written in the Holy Scriptures, in the Bible, for a New Testament, born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, not to do, and I did it anyway, or anything that the Spirit of the Lord directed me not to do, but I did it anyway, whether it was presumptuous sin or whether it was out and out rebellion and disobedience. Father, I confess and I forsake those sins. Any person, persons, groups that I have held unforgiveness or offense against for any reason, God, I'm sorry. I repent. I forgive those people and I release them now in Jesus' name. Any lie or that I've told or I believed about myself or others, God, I repent and I confess these things. Any area of cowardice, being cowardly, oh God, being fearful, I repent, oh God. Any area of unbelief in my life pertaining to you, your word, your spirit, your gifts, I repent, oh God. Father, any area of murder, hatred, strife, sowing discord, division, rebelling, I repent, oh God. Any areas of sexual sin, lust, perversion, homosexuality, fornication, adultery, I repent, oh God. Oral and anal sex, which is sodomy, I repent, oh God. Anything that I've done that's sin in your eyesight, I don't care if man says it all, it's okay. I'm talking about in your word and by your spirit. You say it's sin, I say it's sin. I repent of murdering babies in the womb through going to the voting box and approving of it, or whether I have personally aborted a baby, or whether I have been instrumental in paying for or persuading or pressuring a woman to have an abortion, I repent, oh God, anything that's unlike you and displeasing in your sight, I confess these sins and I forsake them now in Jesus' name. Father, by faith, I receive your mercy, your forgiveness, 
and your cleansing.